Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever it is, wherever you are, welcome to the Good Values Podcast. In this episode, I speak to someone who I met almost a decade ago. It might even be a decade ago, I'm not sure. A good several years ago, let's put it that way. Very, very nice guy, very talented, and I thought it'd be interesting to introduce onto the episode a filmmaker. Now, this is a filmmaker in the sense of being a writer, director, producer, editor, and an actor. Now, in the process of me editing this episode, I realised that there was so much good uh, conversation and content to share that I'd really like to split it into two episodes. So this time it's going to be part two, and this is me talking to the lovely and talented Andy Pearson. Does your do your films have a color palette? Would you do you try to inject certain color grading into your into your films so that you have, say, the green tint or you should make sure things have pink or you want to have certain warmth or cool tones or anything like that? I think I think it's a, a film to film basis. I don't have my own style. Mm. I don't well, I, I have my own style, but I don't have like a like a like this is my palette. Yeah. Um I think it's something I'd like to get better at. Not mm. again, I'm I'm kind of thinking of three things. I definitely would always do it film by film because I think that that's a character. It's a character in the film, the way a film looks. Mm. And so I don't want to go, oh, I only do it this style. And so all my films need to look the same. So it would always be film by film. Um, I think that it's something I need to get better at. Like as in like, it's that's a pre-production thing. You know, in colour grade, you can do great things. But when you when you haven't got a budget, you can't really go well. This, all the characters in this scene are going to wear green because it's about envy and you can't do any of those things because you can't go out and make sure you buy all those green things. Yeah. So you kind of have to work within the environment that, you, that you're in. I, I do like, for things that I write, I have a tendency to lean into that kind of like warm yellow tones mm. with, with browns and stuff like that. Um, so I feel like when I've done my 10th film, I'll have to look back and go, okay, that's my, that's my style. I obviously mm. like that kind of... <clears throat> and I don't know if it's because of growing up on like those... That, that 70s, I'm not, I didn't grow up in the 70s, but I, I, when I grew up, I watched a lot of like um, those kind of like 70s uh, Hollywood films that like Easy Rider and a lot of those mm. have like those yellow kind of film look. Yeah. And I like that look. I'm not a big fan of uh, what, well, it's not I'm not a big fan of the, the, the teal and orange, which is really popular at the moment, mm. but I have a problem with it because it, every film I don't like it when you kind of go, oh, you've, you've shot it the same as every other film. You've caught it. It's a film made by people who've studied film. It, it's it, back to an earlier question. It, it, it's that thing of um, ruining um, the rules, ruining filmmaking, because mm. everyone goes, oh, I know how to make a film because I know all of the rules. You go, yeah, but where's you yeah. in this film? Yeah. You're an artist, aren't you? If all you've done is like made sure you framed it correctly, coloured it correctly, mm. made sure that the actors uh, emoted in the like everything was the rules that you've written, read in the book, you've read, yeah. you know, uh, Sid Field's book, you've read like uh, Save the Cat, you've you know you've done all those things, but where are you? Yeah. Where are you in this film? Where is your emotion? Where's your character? Where's your? And I mean your character as a director or, or yeah. as a filmmaker. Where is you? Because that's the beauty of a film mm. and when you see i've seen great films that i've gone this is a great film but i'm so taken out of it because it's shot so like every other film really yeah. digital really crisp mm. um and yeah and this this kind of like t you know orange and teal look to it mm. um and i just kind of go ah oh, kind of a bit bit boring again because i just feel like it's that thing and it feels very judgmental to be that way because i still um respect them as a filmmaker and still think that they've got stuff but it's that thing where it, you kind of go ah oh, i don't know it feels like there's less thought in the emotion there's lots of thought yeah. of the 
art isn't a, isn't an equation you yeah. know it's not you can't work it out you have to feel it yeah. um, that's why someone like Eggers or or um, like Sophia Coppola or mm. or um, uh, you know Wes Anderson mm. their films are extremely you know they know what they're shooting they know it frame by frame you know like uh, mm. Edgar Wright th- th- there's not a frame in his film that he's making up on the day he knows everything that's happening in that film but they are in the film you don't look at that film mm. and go oh they've done that color and they've done that choice and they made this and it looks like that it, it, they you can almost tell right away that it's their it's their film uh because because they're in it even if mm. it's, even if the film's massively different yeah you know you can still see that it's their film because they're in it that, that, that visually they're in the film you know it's their film i was going to bring up edgar right earlier when you were mentioning um if a film is it's you know shot well but it doesn't have this you won't like it i was going to say i'm kind of i've got an exception to that because i recommended an egna wright film that i didn't like the characters didn't like the script didn't like the story i didn't really like you know the actors and how they did it but i loved the editing and i recommended the film and my brother watched it and he was just like that film wasn't good and i was like it's not a good film but the editing what film was amazing it? um baby driver it's just oh. The, yeah. oh, have you seen it? Yeah, it's not good. It's not a good film, but the editing <laughs> is just amazing throughout it, the film. I enjoy. I watched it again recently because I, 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 because I, I surprisingly really, really loved uh, Last So uh, Last Tango, Last Night in Soho. Lots of Last Night in Soho. I've not seen that yeah. yet. I really enjoyed it. I didn't. I, I'd heard bad things about it. Yeah, me too. And so I kind of went into it going, "Oh, I love Edgar Wright," but I wasn't a fan of Baby Driver because I felt like. It was a lot of style and no substance and i mm. felt like it was a lot of nostalgia porn where it's that thing of like more about what it's trying to be rather than it being something yeah i thought some of it was great but I, some of it just felt like a lot, a lot of towards the end a lot of like coincidence of like why is this person here now why is that a lot of that yeah, going I, at the end that really annoyed me so i went yeah sorry <laughs> but i but i really enjoyed uh last night in soho I really, I, 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 um, I'm not sure if it'd be for you or for why people didn't like it, mm. but I, uh, I mean, I had issues with certain bits in it, but overall, um, I really like. There's a bit at the very beginning of the film, it's shot in this very basic way, like almost like he's gone back to space, and you're like, this is very strange. This is doesn't feel like an Edgar Wright film. It feels like it is, and yeah. it feels like. It's been, of course, it then goes to the seventies, like the sixties stuff, mm. and you go, "Oh, this exists specifically yeah. so that you can you, you can juxtaposition it to yeah. this. That's why it exists that way." Oh, and then that. that all kind of makes sense more as the film goes along. And the... about the contrast, oh, I like it. Before I get to these last three questions, I want to ask you because I'm such a big fan of this show. I wanted to know if you've seen it and if you like it because I think it is like watching movies and that's better call Saul. yes i haven't watched the new series yet because i was yeah. um because i've got netflix at the moment but i'm going to be getting once it's finished mm. i'm going to get netflix just so i can watch it again but yeah i think it's better than breaking bad oh me too me too i, I think, think. It's, it just it's weird because i really enjoyed breaking bad i think there was mm. some bits that were a little bit obvious and it was it do tv things every now and again and it would throw mm. you because you're like what why is this why is this doing a tv thing yeah uh but bear call Saul is just solid all the way through and yeah i'm a big fan of bob odenkirk anyway because i'm a big mr show fan mr so. show yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. Um, um i mean it broke my heart on breaking bad when gus straightened his tie with half of a face i just oh yeah. checked me out at that point i just thought what am i watching what are you doing guys um so yeah no i i had to ask you just because i love and i eat up the the cinematography from that i love all the camera angles and the colors i just think it's a beautiful well considered well composed show i just watched um uh, the bear uh you should you should give that a go it's really good yeah i've not seen that yeah it's yeah. It's, it's brand new it's got like eight it's eight episodes one season it's about a guy who's like a, a really accomplished chef in new york uh none of the this is all none of this exposition happens it throws you right into it yeah uh but his brother has passed away and he's taking over his family's restaurant which is called the beef mm. in chicago so it's very chicago it's all very kind of like everyone calling each other cousins hey cousin hey cousin it's <laughs> like that um but it feels very film filmic and, mm. and it, it, it's really locking into the heat of a of a um of a of a restaurant like a cheat of a 
of a failing restaurant um but I quite it's very shouty and sometimes i'm like oh is this shouty good or shouty just <laughs> like is this a bunch of people who just come right out of like a theater the, a theater yeah. troupe and have just gone like doing their best monologues they can do but yeah. i really enjoyed it and i liked the story and it didn't it didn't uh hold my hand or anything and kind of like told you found things out slowly mm. um and it's like uh I'm excited for. I'm, I'm. I'm hoping it gets a new series because it ends in a way that makes you want to watch a new series. But. I've heard of it, but yeah, you just reminded me because it was a while ago. Well, I, I think it was a couple of weeks ago that a couple of comedians on a podcast mentioned it, and they watch shows intermittently. So, yeah. Which comedians? Um, it was well. It's one comedian, one writer. It's Greg Fitzsimmons and oh, okay, um, yeah. and I can't remember his co-host, but it's it's Sunday Papers. If you've not seen the podcast. Very I'm fun. not saying I'll check that out. Yeah, because I do know. I know. I know this guy. I watch a lot. Of, I I I play video games in, in in the evening and just put on podcasts and stuff. But mm. I, I put it on. I've got a projector and a TV, so I've got a projector where I'm playing with video games and a TV with a video in case they nice. choose something. I yeah, want to yeah. see. Um, but I thought when you said it, that I, that, have you heard of a podcast called "We May Be Drunk"? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, I watched and, uh, with Mark Norman and uh, Sam Morell. I watched yeah. that, and they always do wrecks at the end. So yeah. I, always, I thought it might have been a wreck because they mentioned the bear. Did they? Yeah. No, I need to watch more of We Might Be Drunk. I've only seen, I think I've only seen two episodes, the Bill Burr one, and I can't remember who the other one was. But anyway, yeah. So I'll, I'll have to watch more of those because I love both of those guys. They're good. But, they uh, forget what they say and say, repeat things a lot on it yeah. but i i enjoy yeah. it feels like i always want i don't really drink but i always want to get a drink and just it feels like a nice <laughs> sit down and have a drink and they yeah. should actually say what the drink is on the episodes you can make it yourself yeah well they did on the bill burr one they started to mention what it was because he was he doesn't drink as much but yeah i haven't watched enough episodes to see the tropes that they fall into I think. yeah um, that's good i enjoy it the only other thing that i wanted to say which i haven't said which i might as well is because when i asked you about inspiration I was going to, I tried to ask you that the, the video had broken up and you were giving me an answer and I thought you'd stopped. So I asked you this question and, <laughs> okay. and you came back and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't even hear what you said then. Um, what I asked you was, have you seen a, a 1960s French film called uh, Playtime? I think it's not. I have not. I will, I will note it down though. That is, has inspired me and I'm going to make a, an art film. <laughs> because of playtime and I'm going to be the only actor in it because I'm, that's the reason I've got this beard and this stupid long hair uh -huh, okay. because I'm going to have my hair comes down to about there you know and I'm going to basically cut it progressively and cut my beard to play different characters in different costumes to try and emulate some of the atmosphere of playtime because I love that film and it's okay mesmerizingly strange um there was another film after it by the same person which is not as good but the introduction is fantastic and it's called Traffic. And Traffic has some amazing sequences, but as a film, it's not very good. Whereas Playtime, I think, is a very good film. Okay. Uh, Traffic. Is you know, I'll good. definitely give it a give it a go. I've just I um, it makes me mad. There's two films that I've got that I'm mm. desperate to watch, and I started watching one the other day, but I've I've got one of those VR headsets um, oh, yeah. because I, I need it for my business because I'm trying to like work out do 360 videos and stuff. Nice. Um, but it has virtual cinemas in it and they're amazing mm -hmm. where you can actually watch a cinema so it likes there's literally you can look down and like when the there's a bright bit on the screen yeah. it lights up the chairs in the front row oh, and stuff really? so it's really cool i mean the the people are pretty ropey looking because they're like <laughs> just hand just hands and floating heads and stuff but <laughs> but when when you're not paying attention to them it's quite cool to see i actually watched um uh uh, everything all at, uh, no, everything everywhere all at, all at once. once which is yeah. also amazing yeah, um yeah. But I uh, I started watching. Um, well, I can't think of the name. Fitz uh, Fitz Fitz Caraldo Fitz Caraldo uh, Wyndham Hogg. And I was like, this is amazing. But then I got a headache from being in the VR to turn it off. So, <laughs> and then the other one is uh, Come See, which is a horror like a Polish film about the war, oh, which that. is which looks amazing. And I just haven't sat down. I've not had the moments recently where I feel like I can focus. Yeah. Like what you, when you watch a film, I need to sit and go, yeah. I'm doing this. Uh, yeah. So those are two sort of films, but now playtimes now have been put on the list of things that I need to do as well. Yeah. Um, question that I ask everyone, every episode, so you will have heard me ask um, in the podcast that you watched, what is the most beautiful thing you've seen today? The most beautiful thing? Well, I've been inside most of today, so it's been a lot of confusion. The most beautiful things that I saw today. What was the most beautiful thing? What was editing stuff? I saw there was um, 
uh, I was editing uh, a farmer being given a, a reproduction a Neolithic axe. And that was quite beautiful. So that's probably the most beautiful wow. thing to say. That. I'll give you I'll give you two answers because one answer that's the most beautiful thing. Like I saw it because it was like, yeah, it's like a Neolithic. Like so, the thing I've been filming has been uh, a dig where people are in, near my house where mm. uh, there's lots of uh, Neolithic axes were built in that area, uh, and it's so impressive because a lot of the axes can be found in Yorkshire, can be found down south because wow. somehow with no transportation they were still traveling and trading in some way this was amazing but somebody makes these axes in the traditional way which is getting these pieces of screen which is a stone and then you break it off and chip it off and then they get it to a nice smooth area and then they polish it and it has these massive really sharp edges and they polish them and there's loads of history behind it. it's beautiful mm -hmm. but they made a replica one uh, and it's pretty cool to see and then the other one was a um was I, you know what, it's funny, I can't remember the brand name now, I'm trying to get the brand name, but I was looking up audio recorders and I saw one that I liked the look of and I was like, oh, <laughs> that's that's on the wish list for the next yeah. thing to buy. And so as a filmmaker, you do sometimes find beauty in equipment that would make yeah. filmmaking easier. You're like, oh, that's a beautiful thing. No, I've seen the book. Yeah. I've seen the Bolex for the first time when we, even though the Bolex is a horrible camera to film with, which is what we shot uh, British Winters with, which was yeah. a, Digital Bolex, which um, was a Kickstarter project by these people passionate to make a digital camera that shot like film, like 16 mil mm -hmm. film. And they did, but they, it looks like an old cine camera. So when I first saw that, I was like, oh, it's a beautiful thing. Mm. Um, horrible to film with, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a fantastic answer because there's no way anyone else gives anything like that as an answer. And I think there's a pressure on people when I ask that question to find something with a specific kind of ephemeral quality to it, which I appreciate you being, you know, kind of on, on the level of an editor and sort of saying, I see beauty in this and I've seen beauty in that, because that's that's lovely as well. So yeah, fantastic, thank you. And uh, the last question, there's the last two questions in one. And it's, uh, again, something which I ask artists, but with you being a writer, I'm gonna ask you about your own writing and what do you like and what don't you like about your own writing? Well, the, the easy answer is I'm dyslexic. So I, I don't like that I'm dyslexic when I'm writing because it makes it very difficult. Um, yeah. uh, you know, dyslexia doesn't stop you from being creative. It doesn't stop you from being able to write well, but it will make you have to prove things to death because, you know, uh, the biggest problem with, with trying to proofread, and even if, you, even if you go and buy a book off a shelf right now, you will find typos on it because when we read, we kind of fill in a lot of the blanks. And so it's very hard to find typos. And if you're dyslexic, it's extremely hard to find typos. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's the easiest thing to say, because that's just a, like a, a practical part mm. of writing. Um, what's the thing? I think um, it's weird, because I want to say that, yeah, I think it's a good question. That's a really good question, because a part of me, a part of me thinks about like, um, like completing things, but that's more kind of the guess. Like the idea of like I have a tendency of I've got a lot of things started, but trying to make sure you get them finished and sitting down and dedicating the time to thing. But mm. actual for the stylistic writing style, what do I dislike the most? I think I probably I'm. I don't know if I dislike this most because I think it might be a bit. No, I do dislike it, but I also think it might be a, a style that I write in, and that that has to be the way it has to be because that's who I am. But I. I overthink, I over explain. So sometimes I can, even within writing, especially within the novel for British Winters, mm. there was a lot of um, going down rabbit holes, like, because mm. the character's mind was like that. So it, it was okay to kind of like, he would mention one thing and then just go off on the tangent on somewhere else, which is what I do. Yeah. Um, and, and I sometimes do that in writing now where I'll get, uh, uh, one thought will lead to 10 thoughts mm. and I'll explore that. Um, yeah. And I think that that's something that I probably would like to get better at and be, and be yeah, not, not lose the stylistic like, cause I like it stylistically, but mm. like, um, just cause it, cause again, the problem with that is um, it's interesting in the moment cause you're mm. thinking it, but that doesn't mean that it will be interesting in 10 minutes when you yeah. reread it. You're like, Oh wait, actually, 
this thing that I thought was so, you know, amazing and like, you know, like no one's ever thought this before. And then you read it back and it's like, oh, women are two species. No, like, yeah, sorry, <laughs> that was a callback. Um, um, so something that wasn't in the, in the podcast. Um, yeah, no, the, the uh, yeah, like having a thought yeah. that, um, yeah, in the moment you can feel really, you know, like a genius for a second and then and you go back and you realize you just rambled for 20 minutes. It's just about... inefficient when it comes to in, 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 inefficient storytelling is what you've done. Yeah. So that's why I would, I would say, yeah. But yeah, so you find it easier to say what you don't like. What, what is it you do like about your own writing? Um, oh which is not a criticism, by the way. That's something which I've noticed with artists is they find it very easy to say, I don't like this. This is a problem. I yeah, don't yeah, yeah. Whereas to say, this is what's good about my work. It can be tricky, but... I'm going to say that it's honest in the sense that I do not flinch away from stuff um, that I already know. Like, so within the film that I've just written, uh, there is a moment where a character tries to kiss, a male character tries to kiss a female character because he thinks they're having a moment mm. and he's misread it. Mm. And within it, later on in the, in, in the film, he, he 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 points out how stupid this was and he refers to it like you know I'm, 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 someone did something nice and i kind of did a me too moment the reason why i've done that is because i it's in the zeitgeist it's that's what would happen yeah. and if i was to remove those things i'm trying to ignore what's going on and i'm and I, and, and i don't believe in 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 you know like empirical right or empirical uh, wrong i think that there is this kind of gray area and we live in these gray areas mm. and so i want to write characters in these gray areas that make mistakes that do things that are not right um and i think a lot of writers these days uh would worry either they would be like they would come from a point of view of like hey i'm gonna write this because it's the way people are or they come from a point of view of like or oh, I don't want to offend people. And I think both of those things are rubbish. Yeah. You shouldn't be trying to offend people, but you should also not be so sensitive yourself as a writer. And so, mm. because you become dishonest, you yeah. become dishonest as a writer. I want to write about real people who have real experiences and have real emotions and real feelings and make real mistakes. Mm. Cause that's interesting. Yeah. Writing perfect people who know the right thing to do always is not interesting. And it's also not interesting to have a film that corrects that. Like if you have somebody of bad behavior, you don't need to have a moment in a film. I mean, particularly in this film, I do have a moment where I correct that, but it's because they're having a conversation about that very thing, you know? Mm. But you don't need, the audience knows it's wrong. You don't need the, the character to learn that it's wrong. Yeah. You need to know whether that character, yeah, whether, it, again, it's that thing about like, um, I think some sometimes people forget what the film's saying and and confuse it with what the characters are doing. Mm. You know, um, I'm a big fan of um, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Have you not seen that, you know? I should, I should Have you not seen it? it it's, no. What's funny is I'm, I'm listening to the podcast right now where they're going through the episodes and I genuinely love Rob McElhenney who, who, who wrote it and came, mm. came up with the idea because um, he's lovely. In a, mm. as a person the things he talks about he's really funny but like he's got a really interesting history like a, like he, he went to university but didn't get enrolled so he basically went through university and he only got found out when he was cast as the main the lead in a play and they were like wait we need to have your documentation he's like okay <laughs> i'm out <laughs> they left, you know just genius but um but the concept of the, and but what I was going to say was that they talk about how the first series is kind of a hard watch for him now. Yeah. And I've just tried to, I, I've re watching it with him and I'm like, it is true. I loved the first series when I first watched it, but yeah. it's very rough. It's very ready. And I don't know if it's they're that good of a writer as like later mm. series, they become so really, really proficient at what they're doing. Mm. Uh, but the, that, that can all get cut out. What <laughs> I was going to say was that the story is about the, the comedy is these are terrible people. It's like, let's take Seinfeld, where these are bad people, and amplify it. Yeah. Like, they argue with each other. It's all funny, and they're idiots. Yeah. And so you you like them and hate them at the same time. But everything's about them saying the wrong thing or not understanding something and arguing about it. 90% of the, of the episodes are two of them. Like, they had one that was about buying a gun, and two of them become 
like guns need to be banned and two of them become guns or everything it ends up being an argument about that about gun control yeah. and within that they make really good points of the irony and the uh, the hypocrisy in both sides of those arguments mm. which is great yeah but some people would watch that and go oh these people are terrible we shouldn't have this on tv and you're like no no they know they're terrible yeah that's not what the show's doing the show yeah. the show isn't doing that the characters are doing that yeah. you're completely judging the show based on the characters in the show that's yeah. a problem for me because i yeah. go then then we need to have a, a director who's moral mm. who then writes characters who are moral or yeah. if they're not moral they learn how to be moral or they <laughs> get their comeuppance at the end yeah and that's that's the that's the you know when i was a kid there was that thing of like every film had to have the happy ending so you always knew the end of the film mm. and that became problematic the modern conundrum is that everyone feels like if someone does something bad at some point the film needs to correct this mm. um, in fact if, if you don't mind me having uh, explained something that really bugged me and i and i yeah, you can cut this out or you can leave it in um i hope that i do it i say it the right way because i'm extremely um uh kind of passionate about this well i'm passionate about the, the film so 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 i i watched um there's a tv show it wasn't a great tv show and but i kind of got locked into it and sometimes uh, i am one of those people like i've got ocd with stories sometimes completionist where, like, completionist where like yeah. even i watched all of uh Spart spartacus blood on the sands all right. because a, a mutual friend of ours told me to watch it because he said it was good and i hated it from the moment i put it on till the last episode but i watched the whole thing because i felt like i've got to be able to understand this at some point but it was yeah. terrible and i don't know why anybody likes that show <laughs> um but um so there's a there was a tv show uh, the umbrella academy did you hear about that it was on netflix it no it's based on a comic book and i watched the first series and it kind of got me in because there's a character in it that's a that's a monkey but it talks, oh, yeah, it talks, mm. and it's it walks around, it wears clothes, never explained, and I, and I loved that. For a second, mm. I was like, oh, we got to the point now where everyone's so used to comic books that you can put a character in and not care yeah. that you people go like, wait, that's a talking monkey, yeah. like, why is that a talking monkey? Yeah. And I kind of that kind of hooked me a little bit, and then I I watched all of it, but um, Elliot Page is in it, but Elliot Page was started off hadn't transitioned in the first two series mm. so when the third series came out i'm like oh this is really interesting because obviously they they're going to have them be elliot page because they're now not going to be playing female characters anymore yeah. because they're not female and i thought that's really interesting i wonder how they'll tackle tackle it because it's quite an unusual show and it's very satirical and stuff like that so i wondered how they were going to tackle it so i watched the first episode and i was so disappointed of how heavy handed they dealt with it they they had a moment where where he goes and has his hair cut mm. and then they come back and then someone refers to them as the character's female name mm. and they correct them and they go what do you mean and then they go is this a problem and there's this kind of weird moment of like is and they go no it's not a problem and then there's another moment where she has a full conversation with some, sorry, that he has a full conversation with somebody about it and why it, and I was like, this would have been so much better if you'd have just gone to the table and they would go like, oh, you cut your hair, or they'd have gone to them and they were like, yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm a man. Yeah. Is that okay? And they're like, yeah, it's fine. Move on. Yeah. Cause that would have been so much more progressive in my mind Yeah. to be like, because that's how we should deal with it in life in Casually. life yeah we shouldn't be like we should be like you're what hmm, explain it to me a bit more how's it going <laughs> and how do you feel about it how do you feel about it now and i'm not saying don't be emotional and allow you know if you've got a friend yeah. who transitions be emotional be there for them yeah. but in a day-to-day -day thing you should be like oh i didn't know that about you crack on yeah, i'm now going to use i'm now yeah. going to use male pronouns yeah. you know if i've known you my entire life i might slip up because you know, you, you, you have muscle memory done. in your mouth. Yeah. It, please forgive me those moments. Know that there's no malice in those moments. But from now on, let's move on. You are now this person. I'm not going to treat you any differently than I treated you before. Yeah. Let's move on. And I wanted to do that. And I just felt that was so an example of like, we need to address this. Yeah. But let's be as compassionate. Let's make this a moment mm. for the audience. And I was like, I think that's 
condescend to me. That, yeah, yeah it's, it, it condescend to me. And I'm obviously Elliot Page wanted it to be that way. So that's their wish and that's great. So they don't feel like it's condescending to them. Yeah. But I felt like it was condescending to the trans community, in my opinion. But again, I'm not trans. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I just felt like I would imagine that 90% of the trans community just want to be the the gender they have now assigned to and yeah. just want to get on with their lives and live yeah. their lives day to day. 90% of them are not actors. They're not famous. They're not they're not celebrities. No. You know, they're, they're waiters, plumbers, doctors. Yeah. And my 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 doctor in when I used to live in uh, Rutland was was a was a transgender woman. Yeah. Um. Way before it became way before Kylie Jenner, uh, is it Kylie Jenner? No. Uh, Caitlyn, isn't it? Caitlyn. Is yeah. it Caitlyn? Caitlyn Jenner. Um. Yeah. I don't. I hate the Kardashians, so I don't want to pay attention to their names. But way before Not they the they they put you know like he's like oh. Uh, I did that South Park thing of like, I more remember that you killed someone with your car. Yeah, exactly. I remember. <laughs> um, a woman. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. The, the, um, but yeah, so so, so yeah. like, um, you know, that th they're the people that I care about. Those people that the real people who are out there, and I just felt like that was a disservice to them. Yeah. Because you you wanted to make sure that the audience wasn't going to like. You didn't want. They were worried about internet pushback. I would assume. Yeah. So they wanted to be like, we're going to give this a moment. And going to keep and then do the whole episode they kept coming back to it then there was three separate conversations about the person transitioning into into male and i just thought that, that was so heavy-handed yeah i mean i'm a i'm a fan of elliot page um and always loved you because i love juno and i love a lot of the films that he's been in but i can only imagine and i've not seen the umbrella academy so i could be way off but i can only imagine that elliot page's perception of the public is skewed by the internet trolls and the and the mm. pushback against transgender the transgender community because it's so absurd when you hear it you just think what is the what is the problem i mean granted i make the mistake because i have a friend who or a former friend sadly who is uh the pronouns are they them and i always struggled getting they them correct and i tried to use a device in my head to make sure that i saw them as a they them instead mm. of as any specific pronoun um male or female but they were very understanding because they said that not only is it, you know, it's not it's not he or she, basically. So it's they they understood that it makes it more difficult to almost assign a plural to a to a singular. But that's not a big deal as far as accepting that's who the person is. It's just tricky because of how ingrained it is to assign someone with a, uh, a singular pronoun mm. as what we consider to be a, a plural. But it, they them isn't a plural necessarily because you could say someone's at the door and you could say what do they want yeah, yeah. you know so it's they them is could be singular but it's just a weird thing for the yeah i think i think I, I think that i think that um yeah i mean not to get to it but i think the biggest problem is just people we need to live in a world where people know intent that's that's my big thing it's just yeah. like intent, intent is important Absolutely. like you can't say that word words matter but intent matters more Absolutely. Like if you, you know, if you, you should know the difference between a friend getting a pronoun wrong mm. or saying the name wrong yeah, and being devastated that they have done and, and, and somebody, uh, somebody online being genuinely mean and malicious yeah. and calling you by the wrong pronoun because they want to, because yeah, they don't okay. believe your emotions and they don't believe in your experience yeah um and that's really important and i think that that's i think that that is a problem on the internet with when we start going and i don't like i also don't like um that casual you know well just look it up on ebay oh no i'm sorry on eBay. my brain's wrong today <laughs> look it up on google you know like just do it you know like it's that kind of really a horrible response. dismissive attitude yeah. of like yeah, yeah. you need to learn the new way straight away and you're like yeah. Well, you don't want me to look on Google because I could end up anywhere yeah. <laughs> on Google. I'm right, Bart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, apparently you're not. <laughs> you're not what you say you are. I've learned lots on Google, so yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. the idea of like I don't like the dismissiveness and 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 I understand because again, anybody who thinks that they like us, like oh, you should get offended because I get the wrong pronoun. It's like think of anything in your life, hmm. like um, I'm trying to give an example of something like the like. Um, you know, people would call, I'm, I'm called Andrew, so people would call me Andy Pandy. Hmm. 
And it's not a big thing. But when it's the first thing that people say to you a lot, yeah. it starts grating on you a little bit. So imagine that amplified by yeah. people continuously getting your wrong pronouns all the time. I can understand why even in a, a, an innocent situation, someone would go, oh, uh, you know, because it, it's happening a lot of time. That's understandable and I have yeah. no problem with that. But I think in t understanding intent and having both sides have an empathy. Like mm. if you are a trans person, having empathy for people learning new ways yeah. and for, 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 for struggling to remember things because a lot of things are muscle memory, you know, yeah. like I, 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 um, I was calling a guy who's called Barry. I was called, uh, sorry, it was called Brian. I called him Barry mm. for two weeks worked yeah. out then i was told that he was he's called brian <laughs> and i still have to correct myself and that was just two yeah. weeks of calling him the wrong name yeah, yeah that name's still in my mouth so imagine if you've known someone your entire life and i think not and i think with a non-binary it is more difficult in the sense of i think if someone transitions into a into a different gender mm. it's easier to go to to you know to drop on one side yeah but if you don't use they and you're if you're not really using they in your day-to-day -day vernacular, yeah, then you're you're not just you're not going, oh he, she, you're not like yeah. you're not just you can't you go they. It's a very yeah. difficult one to go in. So I think that understanding on both sides. Anyway, we're going to run out of another right. meeting. Yeah, benefit of the doubt <laughs> is the is the lesson really. Give people the yeah. benefit of the doubt. But um, at the end of each episode, I always ask the guest, is there any social media that you'd like to direct the audience to? Uh, yes, so you can you can follow Wild Kindness Films on Instagram, um, which I would hope Simon will put up a little logo somewhere here if I, if I send in the links. Um, I've also got a Facebook page uh, and uh, the main place to look at any videos or films, trailers, would be on the, uh, the YouTube. So that's the Wild Kindness Film Productions uh, YouTube page, um, which you'll see some music videos, uh, the short uh, that I did with Rock A, Seven Sharp, the whole film is on there, so you can watch that. Fantastic. That's it. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you so much for being uh, on the podcast. If you ever have anything you want to promote, I'd, I'd love to have you back on again. It's been a great conversation, and uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. No, no, thank you. I apologise for all the editing you've got to do now, but uh, <laughs> thank you for having me on um I, I have i have followed the uh, the channel it's really great what you're doing um i like yeah i like it's it, it there need to be more uh, the, i think there's a lot of youtubers out there that to get clicks and to get money they're they're covering the big stuff which is the you know big movies your hovels and all of that nonsense mm. and there needs to be more people saying you're not looking here yeah. so look here and that's kind of that's the vibe that i'm getting from this from these videos is there is a bunch of artists and art that you don't know about that you might be interested in yeah. you know I, I think that's really important well it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much and uh yeah i'll see you uh, i'll see you soon okay take care bye, bye okay so that is part two done now i hope you enjoyed that part of the conversation i thought it was really interesting because there are lots of overlaps between making artwork and being a filmmaker. Several considerations. I mean, he's brought up colour palettes himself without me prompting it. It's a similar consideration as when you're a painter or anyone who works with colour in art. That's something you have to consider. Composition, storytelling, all of these things factor into art making almost equally as it would to a filmmaker because you have to show something to an audience which they understand or they can interpret in their own way and that's what a filmmaker does i mean to greater or lesser extents artists and filmmakers do that um and i have preferences that i'd like to discuss with andy now he's one of these people who i wish i could have had a longer conversation with him but in absolute truth this is you know each episode of the podcast is around 40 minutes long we had three 40 minute meetings and that's why it was so hard to try to edit this down to one episode. And I just didn't have the heart to cut out a lot of the conversation that you've just seen now. So what I mean, I don't know. I'd like to have Andy on again. I don't know his availability. I'm going to hopefully speak to him again before too long. But what a lovely person and what an honest conversation. I really appreciate him being on. 
and I hope you support all of the social media links that he mentioned. I'll leave them in the description below. Please check them out and support his productions. Uh, he really deserves it. He's a very kind and talented person. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then please leave a like, comment down below, subscribe to the channel, ring that notification bell, share it with any friends and family. I want to thank you all for watching and for the people who leave comments all the time. It means the world to me. Thank you so much. And I will see you in the next episode.